So I'm Monica Kehoe from uh, Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, or DPERD, which I'll call for short, um, in based in Western Australia. And um, today I wanted to share with you a little bit about how we're using nanopore sequencing um, to sequence uh, RNA plant viruses, which is the main, um, the main type of virus that, that we work on. Uh, so a lot of people might ask why we might want to sequence these plant viruses. And for us, it comes down to plant disease management. And you could look at a plant and say that has a virus and you can't cure that plant, but it does matter which virus it is because for to make sure that you can effectively manage um, these viruses in the spread in your field, you need to know which one. Um, so you need to be asking the right question and there's a broad range of tools that you can use. Um, you wanna make sure that you're using the right tool for your diagnosis um, because it's important to get the right virus ID and to know which vector might be spreading that virus because the strategies you're going to use to control that and to manage that are going to be different depending on all of those things. And uh, the plant virus genomes that we work on are really small. So the biggest one that I have um, worked on recently would have been about 18,000 nucleotides long. The things I'm going to talk about today are less than 10,000 nucleotides long. So it's a little bit different to some of the long read stuff, which I love watching, but that's not the, not the game that I'm playing here. So you would have seen, um, possibly heard about the Cassava Virus Action Project and Tree Lab, um, which I'll touch on again in a moment. So we've shown that we can do rapid diagnostics using this technology in the field for DNA viruses. Um, but rapid diagnostics also has um, a role to play in the laboratory. So we want to increase the turnaround time, or want to decrease the turnaround time to result in the lab because that gets results out to farmers better, they can react faster. Um, and so what I've been asking is um, how we can use uh, this technology in-house for our whole genome sequencing uh, approaches. And um, it's also uh, for research and monitoring tools. Um, so like I mentioned, we can already do this in the field um, from extraction to sequence to ID in just a few hours, which um, later on you can hear more about that. Charles is gonna be giving a lightning talk. Um, and it's, it all plays, all plays into the end result with some integrated pest management solutions. So uh, the team was able to then provide the correct, correct cassava variety to the farmer that was resistant or tolerant to the viruses that were there, which allows them to increase their yield. So in, at DPERD in the diagnostics lab, when we get um, a sample comes through the door, so this is an example of a pasture, pasture plant that came in and um, it's got some pretty nice virus symptoms there. Uh, the veins of the, of the leaves being yellow and we have a range of choices for the things that we can do. So we can do some biological testing, um, but that tends to take a lot of time. That can take weeks. Uh, we can use serological methods, which can be very quick, down to take a couple of days. We use molecular methods, which is um, more and more becoming what we're, what we're using. So PCR, qPCR, lamp PCR. And then we have sequencing. So Sanger sequencing has been used um, for a while. It, it takes us a couple of days to get a result. We don't have a facility on site. Um, the next generation sequencing technologies have been really cool for some of the research applications, but that takes time and we are not a lab that has access to a larger sequencer. So um, that's just a little bit of an introduction and um, the whole genome sequencing of plant viruses has been something that's been is of interest to me for a long time now. And so what we used to have to do um, using Illumina sequencing, we would wait until we have enough samples because we'd want to pull them onto um, one lane of the sequencer. We'd send our total RNA to a third party provider and then they would do the library prep and the QC and then we would wait. And sometimes that would take months. So that's expensive, not only um, dollar value, but time as well. So, um, and really only limited us to using it in a research capacity. So it's just a photo up there. Um, when I did my PhD, I was looking at a disease in lupins called black pod syndrome. It took me 18 months to get that data and to analyse it. If I'd had, had access to, to MinIron then, I think I could have done a whole lot more. Um, would have had that result a lot faster. So recently, um, we've been focusing on the nanopore sequencing. So all of the plant viruses that we work on in Western Australia are RNA viruses, and only a small proportion of them actually have a poly A tail. So that was the first challenge that we had to overcome. Um, and also using, if some of the viruses that do have a poly tail, that's great. We can use the protocols sort of as, as they exist. But if, even if we knew that a plant was sick with a virus with a poly tail, we still don't know what else 
might be lurking in there. So if we were to just go ahead and sequence um, relying on that poly A tail, we might miss something. So I want to be able to use a method that isn't biased in that way. Um, the direct RNA protocols, um, you know, off straight off the shelf, also use the poly A tail method. And I've also, um, poly A tail being at the three prime end means that if your strands of RNA aren't full and intact, you're going to get a bias of sequencing to that end, might be missing the other end of that. So for us, avoiding false negatives is just as important as uh, avoiding false positives. And so what we've been doing, um, method that we've kind of settled on at the moment, using host ribosomal depletion with the ribo minus plant kit, um, first strand synthesis with the superscript 4, random priming with, um, using random priming for the reverse transcription, and we're using the, been using the LSK 108 and moving to the 109 kit. And uh, we do also barcode sometimes as well, although the demultiplexing of the barcoding has caused us some, some headaches along the way. Um, so I wanted to go through a couple of examples of things that we might, we might be doing. So this is a virus called Pepamar model virus, often affecting capsicums um, and some other, uh, other, other similar things. And uh, what we did was we took an extraction of total RNA, we treated it exactly the same with the ribo minus, with the RT, all of those steps, right up until library preparation, that sample got split and one went to Illumina, one went um, and one we did the minion sequencing on. And we got some really nice results, which I wasn't too surprised by, but mostly I'm doing this so that I can prove to other people that this is a valid, <laughs> valid method that we can do, that we can use instead of, instead of Illumina. So 99.9% um, accuracy between the Illumina final sequence and the nanopore final sequence. And when I looked really closely at the very few discrepancies that there were, they were mostly to do with um, a, a run of a particular base. So um, we either got an N or we missed, missed a base. Um, which one's correct? <laughs> um, I think that's something that um, is pretty interesting. Um, but I'm actually really happy with that. For all the purposes that we want to do for ID, that's, that's, that's really that's perfectly acceptable. And actually, I'm, I'm happy enough with that to go on to some downstream analysis. I think that's, that's fine. Um, de novo assembly as well was really good. We were able to get full length contigs, um, full length genome contigs from some of the de novo assembly. Um, don't always get that with Illumina. <laughs> we do get it um, often enough, but the nanopore, it was really nice to see that coming out there too. And so the second thing that I wanted to look at was multiple infections. So like I said, often uh, a plant can have virus symptoms and may they can be more severe if they're multiply infected, but not always. And so this was a pea sample that turned out to have three different viruses from two different families in it. So the first one, PC bore mosaic virus, this one is actually a potivirus, which means it does have the poly A tail. The other two, um, phase B and mild yellows virus and turnip yellows virus are in the Ludio, Ludioviridae family. They're both poliroviruses. So the first one, 99.8% um, comparison to the Illumina sequences, again, we're really happy for that. And um, also being poly A, that would have come out um, if we hadn't, um, if we'd used the, used the method the other way. But when we, we did try that, and we don't get the reads associated with the poliroviruses. Um, the accuracy, or the, com the comparison of the two, two viruses at the bottom, 98.6 and 99.1, that's still pretty good. Um, I've already had some really interesting conversations about downstream about some of the analysis here. Those two viruses, both being poliroviruses, um, they, um, they're pretty closely related. They are, they are recognized as being different species, but I do wonder sometimes about mapping, whether some of the reads might be mapping to both of those. So um, I'm really keen to try some new stuff I've learnt next week to look at saving the unused reads and then mapping them again, so sort of a cascade mapping system in these, in these situations. And again, with the de novo assembly, um, we got some, I was really happy with the results on the, the recovery of the full genome sequences that we were getting from that. I had an interesting question this morning from someone who said, why would you want to do de novo? Like the, the genomes are so small. Um, but the thing is, if you map to a reference, well, one, you're assuming that you know what you have, and number two, you are, you're kind of biasing your answer, you know, like you, we want to look at a sample and say, what's in here? Not, I think this is. So, um, uh, yeah, just to reiterate that one, <laughs> it's my <laughs> at the moment, not all viruses have a poly A tail, so a lot of this has been um, getting
getting that part of the method down and um, I think moving forward it means that it really opens up um, a lot of possibilities for us. We did try the direct RNA kit um, because I'm looking, for, I'm looking for time savings and it's a really cool tool and I can see all the applications that have been talked about here at the conference have been really exciting. Um, for us, it, at the moment, it's um, the risk of false negative is, is too high. We, we might miss a lot of, a lot of viruses um, that are lurking there. And um, with the poly-A tail being at the three prime end of the genome, um, we've got less chance of getting the full coverage of, full coverage of the genome from that sample. And we can't barcode that. So the barcoding um, is a real help in the diagnostic setting to bring the cost down per sample, although fungal is definitely, definitely going to help with that. Um, so um, protocols that specifically look at co-infections and I'm interested in things that might be able to take into account things that are both DNA and, and RNA. Um, the barcoding for the direct RNA and also having a, having a bit of a mess around with the adapters for the direct RNA kit. Um, I've ordered some that are going to be specific to particular plant virus families and see how they go. We want to try and see if we can do random priming on that as well. And something that uh, is um, sort of like a sort of, sort of as soon as you fix one part of the, the pipeline, it tends to have a flow on effect and the next step becomes the bottleneck. And for us, that's data analysis. So it was exciting at the data, data for breakfast session this morning to hear some of the progress that's happening there, um, particularly the de novo assembly, because I think that's really important for diagnostics. And um, I think that's going to be really exciting to try and automate some of that. So we do some work with the Pawsey Computing Centre in Western Australia, um, looking at getting some of those workflows happening on their systems. And like I mentioned, fungal is something that's going to be um, going to be really helpful for us. Uh, so yeah, thank you for your time. But I would also like to um, thank Nanapore for having me here. Um, it's been a, my first first meeting, and it's been really exciting. Um, but for the acknowledgements, it's not just me that does this work. So my colleagues at DeepHerd, Craig, Ben, Brenda, Treeping, and Sam. And Sam had a lot to do with um, getting the RT step of these protocols right. Um, the Kasawa Virus Action Project, um, we work really closely with Laura, Charles, Peter, Joseph, and the rest of the team there. You'll be able to hear Charles later today um, in his lightning talk. And uh, Marco from the Pawsey Centre. Thank you.